It was a clear black night, a clear white room. Ed Life C was back at work, trying to consume some facts for this video so I can get some sleep. Seeing lots of patients and answering up. What was the first science fiction? Up for debate, but I would submit Mary Shelley's Frankenstein as the first story that truly used real science to inspire fiction. I'm sure you recognize this device to my right. Attach pads. A cardiac defibrillator. To find out how we get from Dr. Frankenstein to this life-saving device, cast your mind back over 200 years. Long before the current wars of Edison and Tesla, to the feud between two Italian eponyms. Familiar to anyone who has ever studied electricity, Luigi Galvani and Alessandro Volta. I wonder if this defib features a full bridge rectifier. Based in Pavia, Volta, most famous today for having lent his name to the Chevrolet Volt, had already established himself as a world leader in the fascinating and still rather new field of electricity. Meanwhile, in Bologna, Galvani, from whom we get uh, the song Galvanized by the Chemical Brothers, <laughs> discovered that frogs' legs twitch when electricity is applied to them, or even when in contact with certain metals. Volta asserted correctly that the electricity came from the metals used in the circuit, and the tasty hors d'oeuvre was merely acting as a conductor, or an electrolyte in this case. But Galvani felt the electricity came from within the animal itself, calling this animal electricity, reflecting our primitive early understanding of electricity's role in life. He wasn't entirely wrong. He discovered that muscles were actually acting as sensitive detectors of electricity, something that would lead on to the discovery of cellular action potentials. So, as the great men of science tend to do, they got into a flame war, and Galvani enlisted the help of his nephew, Giovanni Aldini. Aldini was obviously an ardent hashtag animal electricity supporter and decided to prove this by demonstrating the medical benefits of electricity. He used Volta's voltaic pile, an early form of battery, to shock corpses and make executed criminals sit volt, I mean, bolt upright. At Newgate Prison, which used to stand just a few kilometers from where I am now, he applied a current to George Foster, a recently executed murderer. On the first application of the process to the face, the jaws of the deceased criminal began to quiver, and the adjoining muscles were horribly contorted, and one eye was actually opened. In the subsequent part of the process, the right hand was raised and clenched, and the legs and thighs were set in motion. Soon, reaction videos started flooding the primitive internet, claiming that Aldini was bringing the dead back to life. In Switzerland, Lord Byron, Percy Shelley, and 19-year-old Mary Godwin were telling each other ghost stories. And as her father was pals with Humphrey Davy and William Nicholson, Britain's leading electricity researchers, Mary made up a ghoulish tale of a mad scientist reanimating the dead with electricity, drawing directly on galvanism. Percy clearly found this such a turn-on that within no time, Mary and he were married, and not two years later, she published Frankenstein, or the modern Prometheus. Over the subsequent centuries, our understanding of electricity has charged forwards with shocking speeds. We all now learn in school how there are electric currents inside cells, how action potentials move our limbs, and how our brain activity is positively grounded in the science of electricity. But perhaps no organ is as strongly associated with electricity as the heart. <coughs> Just 20 years after the publication of Frankenstein, Carlo Matteucci showed that each heartbeat produces some electrical activity. A steady flow of household names in science and medicine. Bird, Bence Jones, Addison, Kelvin, Duchenne, all played their part in advancing our abilities and our knowledge in electricity. Before, in 1887, Augustus Waller from St. Mary's in London published the first electrical heart tracing, electrocardiogram, or ECG. 
Side note, why are the points on an ECG labeled P, Q, R, S, T, and sometimes U, instead of the more logical A, B, C, D, E? Willem Eindhoven, the Dutch inventor of the first practical ECG, did indeed use ABCD for the four deflections he initially recorded, but later developed a correction formula, so had to adopt new letters for the derived deflections, and use the second half of the alphabet. And continuing a custom started by Descartes to denote consecutive points on a curve, Eindhoven started with P. But so far, even though we now had immeasurably greater comprehension of how electricity affects the heart, we had no way of reliably using it to treat anybody. That was until 1931, when the first pacemaker, a large, unwieldy device, was used. Sixteen years later, surgeon Charles Beck saved a boy's life with two spoons. He had been building on work by William Kubenhoven, experimenting on animals by putting them into cardiac arrest and then shocking them out until one day a 14-year-old boy arrested during an operation. Out of desperation, Beck sent for his research device and successfully used it to defibrillate the boy. Let's hope he uh, cleaned the fur off first. Clear! <coughs> Clear! <coughs> Doctor, he's gone. <sighs> this is the part of the job I hate. Meanwhile, in modern-day Kyrgyzstan, Eskin and Klimov pioneered a new, more powerful defibrillator that would work without the minor inconvenience of having to open up somebody's chest. I had no idea until I researched this video that the USSR had invented a portable defibrillator in 1959. Outside the Soviet Union, the father of emergency medicine, cardiologist Frank Pantridge from Norn Iron, created the first portable defibrillator in 1965. I say portable, but it was really more of a welterweight. He put it in ambulances, and soon the Pantridge plan caught on. It was enthusiastically adopted, especially in America, and just six years later, in 1972, achieved a high profile when a portable defibrillator saved the life of President Lyndon Johnson after he suffered a massive heart attack in Virginia. We had now developed options for shocking patients out of lethal cardiac arrest rhythms in emergencies, but we didn't have any solutions for the much more common problem of a heart that just beat too slow. The aforementioned external pacemaker worked for a short-term problem, but many hearts require lifelong pacing, and a patient couldn't remain attached to an immobile box. A hero of mine that I've mentioned in a previous video, Walt Lillehei, was operating when a blackout hit Minnesota, and he lost his patient because the pacemaker plugged into the mains stopped working. In frustration, he approached Earl Backen, an electrical engineer with a small company, to try and create something better. Backen decided to try out this fancy new doohickey called a transistor, allowing him to create the world's first wearable pacemaker and placing his company, Medtronic, on its way to becoming the largest medical device brand in the world. It's easy to forget just how unbelievable it is that in a short space of time, we've harnessed the power of electricity to save lives. From the mysterious force that fascinated Galvani and Volta, to the present day where something like a pacemaker insertion is so routine, it was one of the first skills I learned when I started cardiology training years ago. And this device, now available weighing just a few kilograms, a far cry from Frank Pantridge's huge portable defibrillator has saved countless millions of lives the world over. I use it on a regular basis. In fact, I've already used it this shift, not this particular one, and I'm happy to say with a good result. Decades after inventing the wearable pacemaker, Earl Backen, then the recipient of two pacemakers himself, would write his memoir explaining how he became fascinated with electricity and its role in creating life. He would pinpoint the exact moment that his interest was piqued to Eight years old, watching a movie in the cinema. None other than the 1931 classic horror featuring Boris Karloff, Frankenstein. I'm a doctor, not an engineer. Yes, I'm quite aware that I last studied electricity at school, and even though the focus of this video wasn't how electricity works, I thought I'd brush up my knowledge with Brilliant's daily challenges, because this week, two dealt with that exact topic. Okay, question one. Circuit diagram, okay, 10 volts. What's the voltage across each bulb in parallel? Well, four and four add up to eight, so is it two and two? No, that, that'll exceed 10, so it must be one and one. Click. Damn it, let me, I, I mean, that's what I meant to do, it was 
deliberate to show you that there is a community discussing answers for all the daily quizzes and people will helpfully explain uh, and answer your questions. It's a really awesome, supportive community. Okay, part two, let's get back on track. Three bulbs, fine. Uh, remove one bulb. So what's going to happen? Well, let's think. A and B. So, so I think A and B uh, unaffected. Definitely. Crap. Freak. <laughs> Sorry, Medi. Okay, let's get back to basics here. Electricity. Cool. That's it. Classical mechanics. Bingo. Let's go for that. Ah, yes. Formula One. Back in familiar territory. That's Monaco. Oh, it, it tells you that. Well, I bet you didn't know that that corner is the Grand Hotel Hairpin. Formerly Lowe's. Formerly Fairmont. Well, let's go. Bang. Boom. Kablam. Pow. Shazu, <laughs> confidence restored. Brilliant have been really supportive to me, people. This is my fourth video on the trot that they've sponsored, so please do show them some love. Visit brilliant.org slash medlife, and you can sign up entirely for free. But the first 200 people to visit the link will also get 20% off the premium annual rate if you choose to upgrade. So instead of giving me money that I'll just spend on a filthy shish kebab, visit the link and see if you know more about electricity than me. Well, that's my set of nights finished I'm on my way home. But just to let you guys know that I pay attention to what you say, I took notice of your uh, some of your comments after my Neil deGrasse Tyson video saying that I shouldn't film while driving. And I agree with you, I'm not going to do that anymore. Especially not after a set of nights like this where I'd be tired. So instead, I'm just going to make videos while I'm on my bike. 